Brave New Conversations is funded by subscribers like you. After eight years of dropping how many millions of pounds of bombs, firing how many millions of rounds of ammunition, and on the other hand spending how many billions of dollars in, in, in development aid, if after eight years people haven't joined your side, they're probably not to join your side. Well, they probably have a good reason for being on another side than you. And the, the point to keep gripping on to, too, is that these people who looked favorably on the Russians and now look favorably on us did not win. And part of the reason they were, they were not able to win support or to mm -hmm. destroy or to neutralize yeah. the other people it, uh, in that country. And, and there's no reason to think that it will happen now. And, and just like Ambassador Eikenberry said in his descent to the troop increase, which I, I'm very proud of, I'm very proud to have served with him and especially proud to have uh, seen his, his, uh, his descent. Um, there's a, a dependency. After eight years, they are, the Afghan government is dependent upon us to do everything. And it was a most likely the same way in the Soviets. That's why Najibullah only survived for three years, because he was dependent upon an outside power to keep him propped up. Same way with Karzai. He was dependent upon us to, to prop him up, and he's not even worthy to be propped up. He's mm -hmm. it, 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 corrupt, illegitimate, mm -hmm. has no interest in, in, in bettering his country. Really only him and, and his, his, co yeah. his, co his, his people are only really uh, interested in lining their pockets. And you see the people he, he surrounds himself with, uh, war crimes. Uh, yeah, the people he surrounds himself with, like Fahim and Dostum, and these guys are, are, are war crimes villains, uh, uh, drug traffickers, and not like drug traffickers, like they've got a, a, a pound of pot in their pocket. They're, you're talking guys who are, who are dealing in hundreds and thousands of kilos of, of heroin. Um, these are very despicable, horrible people that our troops should not be dying in support of. Well, it's a shame on us that they okay. are. Yeah, and another aspect of that I noticed in reading this stuff is we'll be there until they, uh, what the phrase they used in Vietnam, we'll stand down as they stand up. Yeah, yeah, We're yeah, there to yeah. provide a shield while they will take over the task. Well, since they're well aware from past experience that they will never be able to do it by themselves, the more they stand up and show capability and offensive fighting force and discipline and everything else, there's every prospect that the U.S. will use that as an excuse to leave, whereupon they lose. Yeah. So their incentive to take over the fighting from the U.S. is nowhere on, the, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to the Vietnam experience, of yeah. course, as well, but I would sure it would apply here uh, as well, because on the one hand, if somebody else can do the fighting a lot better than you can anyway, because of their helicopters, their intelligence, their communications, yeah. uh, their weapons and everything, why should you do it? Yeah. That's one point. And the other point is, if you become capable to substitute yourself for them, they leave, in which case you're there alone and you, you cannot succeed. So there's really no incentive to uh, ever, so long as the U.S. troops are there, yeah. to stand up and do that. All right, you're talking from somebody who went over there and the problems you faced when yeah. you went over there as I went to Vietnam yeah. in 1965. And uh, uh, it, it, one gets caught up in the question of, couldn't this be done better, yeah. surely better than we're doing, and, as it could have been? And of it's really it easy, particularly this is what I did for my living for 12 years. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. it's, so it's really easy yeah. just you know, to have this so, conversation wrapped around the how of it or the mechanics of it. And that's not, we, we should be talking about the why. No, and yeah. we, you and I could talk about that yeah. for a long time yeah. with, very, with great interest. Uh, but you said it so well in your resignation letter, and since then, that you're not, you didn't leave, you didn't take this unusual action, extraordinary action, really not only to leave, but to speak out and work against the policy to try to warn people, not just quietly go on mm -hmm. to some other line of business. Not because of the way we were doing it, or that it could be done better, uh, but why? Yeah. And you know, uh, whether we should be doing it at all. And uh, that's the question you raised, which a is, absolutely. is very Absolutely, well. why into what yeah. end, not the how. Yeah. I don't it, want to debate it, what McChrystal, yeah. General McChrystal says. Why and to what end are we in Afghanistan? Yeah, because when we, I'll, I'll finish this off if I may in one or two minutes, dismiss it. Uh, we, you and I could talk about, we didn't have the language, we didn't yeah. learn. So you could say, well, that's easy. We can learn languages, send it to language school, <laughs> you know, we'll send them to counterinsurgency school. And the, uh, <coughs> I think there's, a two fundamental, a fundamental thing that's being missed in that. 
the counterinsurgency doctrine, which the army seems to have adopted now as our new, as our new way of doing things. This is what we're going to do in the mm -hmm. future. They're missing not only that it could be done, they see correctly, it could be done better in some sense than we've done in the past with fewer casualties on both sides and more efficiency and we could stay longer and cheaper and so forth. But there's a fundamental flaw in the idea of counterinsurgency in U.S. hands as applied in our hands to foreign countries. And that is, hard as it is for Americans to conceive of this, we're foreigners there. Yeah. And we remain foreigners even after we've been to counterinsurgency school yeah. and even if we learn their language. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, the idea that by a certain set of cookbook rules on counterinsurgency, you can get people to accept your authority and to fight for you and to accept the authority of the people you have designated as proxies yeah. to rule over them is false. Yeah. I would even go so far as to say that I don't think any foreign country has ever applied counterinsurgency in the sense of winning the actual willing support of the people yeah. and the authority of the people. It's never happened. Uh, it, it's not going to happen. And there is the question of whether you have a right. Yes, if you believe that empire run by Americans is the good empire as opposed to evil empire, and that we have a right to do this, to run the world, basically, yeah. then you can ask the question of how we do it. Let me mention one other analogy from both my experience but the, the Soviet experience. When I was there in 86, uh, as I was saying, they were showing the brochures in, 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 in Russia, Russia, in Moscow. I spoke to, um, uh, oh, well, I'm reading the same documents you were talking about from the National Security Archive, yeah. which are amazing. Yeah. You, I totally agree with you. You, it would, you're reading the same thing now or next year yeah. in Obama's cabinet. Yeah. Uh, Oh my God, you know, but if we leave, uh, people will say we were feckless. Why were the Soviet, why were our troops killed already? Yeah, uh, yeah. We made a mistake earlier. Uh, we've been disloyal. We're, we're uh, leaving our allies and stuff like that. We're a failure. Um, but a guy named Velikov, very good guy, Evgeny Velikov, who was the top science advisor to Gorbachev, and I was talking to him mainly about nuclear policy, which he was very involved in in which I wanted to influence. So I wanted to talk to him about nuclear arms control. But we got on to Afghanistan. And he said, and he was a, a top advisor to, to Gorbachev at that point. Now, if you've been reading these documents, you know, that's just when Gorbachev had been in for one year saying, mm -hmm. this isn't working. Yeah. What can we do? You well, know, how, how do we get out? It's similar to, I, I know conversations with, with folks on Capitol Hill and in the administration of, what the hell are we yeah, doing? Well, and yeah. and how, how can we get out? Yeah. So. But one very strong point is I was just reading these documents. I was rereading, I was reading something that Velikov had said to me at the time that was clearly now being said on the inside, which is we need to get out and all we ask, all we ask is a neutral government friendly to us. Is a neutral, that's all we, we yeah. want to leave behind, a, a friendly government yep. there on our border. Not too much to ask, you know, so we've been, after all, think of all we've spent and we've been dying and coming home. So Velikov said that to me. He said, we're getting out. We're getting out. All we ask, this was 86, early 86. Now, they got out in early 50, uh, 89, yeah. three years later. So he said, um, all we ask, all we want is a friendly, neutral government. And I said, Evgeny, you're not getting out. You have not started to get out. You are not on the way out. You're there. You will not start to get out until you give up the determination to decide what government will succeed you yeah. and to determine the government yep. of Vietnam. If that's the problem, you have to stay there to do it. And eventually they did, uh, to my surprise actually, even sooner than I expected. But it took a while, yeah, a did. long time. And we're hearing that now, you know, if only all we ask, you know, in yeah. uh, in Afghanistan is this or that. We, and, we keep, and we keep changing our goals. We keep, we went there for, for I, I don't think you'll find anyone who will argue against us actually going there in 2001. Hmm. Um, uh, certainly if, if, if you find someone, I, I have a question why they would argue against that, but it's now 2009. We keep changing what our goals are. We keep changing what, um, what we want to get out of this, what the benefit of our, our, our troops dying is for. And we keep changing it, and, and it's wrong. I mean, we went there for one 
particular or specific reason, we've accomplished well, that, we need to move on. What it comes down to is there really aren't many good reasons for killing other people en masse. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're, I'm not a total pacifist, you're not a, yeah. a total pacifist. And there have been reasons in the past. World War II is, is yeah. a big, shiny example. If, um, if there was some benefit to the United States, if this was going to make the United States safer, I would be all for you know, our occupation there. But it's not making us safer. So mm -hmm. it, it's, 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 yeah, I'm, a very real, I'm very realist in, in a, lot of, a lot of these the things I say. And just, uh, foreign policy should be done for the benefit of the United States. I mean, we've, we've said this so much, maybe we put it in earlier, but something I've been thinking here. A big analogy is our total unwillingness to learn anything from the French experience yeah. in Vietnam, which was against the same people in the same terrain, literally the same leaders in the same country, mm -hmm. in the same terrain uh, there with American money. Uh, so we didn't bother to translate the French books on the war. I, I spent a lot of effort trying to get Rand, with some success, yeah. to translate a couple of the books that they never bothered to learn because yeah. the French, they lost two world wars. We had to come in and help them, you know. Yeah. They're racist, unlike us. You know, that didn't even have to be said. They're racist. That's a problem. They're colonialists, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And they didn't have helicopters. Yeah, that's so going to make. Yeah. They only had a few. Yeah. That's going to make all the difference. Well, the uh, again, we're not. We don't learn from the Russians. And I think what it comes down to is, yes, for all their brutality, and yes, Russia is a different society and so forth. I think we should be telling our leaders right now, or asking them, give us a good reason why we will have any greater success than the Soviets did. I don't think there is a reason. No, the only. I think the only thing we have for us is, is uh, the only reason why we think we do better than the Soviets is, is our own hubris. That, that's the only th reason I think so. Uh, there's a book called The Bear Went Over the Mountain. It was written uh, at the end of the 80s, I believe, by uh, a guy named Grass, I think. I can't remember. However, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good primer on the Soviets' tactical experiences in Afghanistan fighting the Mujahideen. Uh, my friend who went in with uh, Second Battalion, 7th Marines, into Helmand Province in uh, the summer of 2008, and it was very bloody, and 2-7 lost a lot, of, a lot of good dudes. Um, but after they were done, they took this book, The Bear Mountain Over the Mountain, and they took out the, the, the tactical and graphic overlays, the, the illustrations of how the, yeah. how, how the Mujahideen fought the Soviets. And then they took those overlays of, of ambushes and other attacks, and then they looked at their own experiences. And in some cases, almost down to the same terrain features, same geographical features, they were attacked the same way that uh, the Afghans had attacked uh, the Soviets. Uh, 20 years earlier. Yeah. Uh, I mean, really remarkable. This, I mean, like literally yeah. almost identical. Uh, remarkable. I was smiling when you said that because I could see where it was going. It was exactly like that in, in Vietnam, the, where a very, almost nobody ever looked at the French yeah. maps of where the Viet Cong, or then called the Viet Minh, yep. had controlled. And of course, they were the same places that they controlled under us, yeah. where they had the support of the population thoroughly and where the terrain favored them. So you know, one of the things people keep, uh, you know, uh, one of the tenets of counterinsurgency is that uh, uh, you have to separate the insurgents from the population. Mm -hmm. One of the things we kept saying over there is like, how do you separate the insurgents from the population when the population is or are the insurgents? Uh, and, and, and it's our unwillingness to acknowledge that there are a large group of people who are not on our side and who won't be on our side and who were never on uh, the side of the Afghans that are on our side and who were never on the side of the foreign pow occupying yeah. powers. And we have to accept that and acknowledge that and realize that just fighting them will only beget more fighting. Fighting is only, putting more troops is only gonna fuel this insurgency. I'm really afraid that we're gonna put uh, 20, 30, 40,000 more troops and all we're gonna do is put them in more valleys or villages where we're not presently at and more people are gonna fight us. Or we're gonna do this thing where we secure the population centers and just barricade ourselves in, garrison ourselves in the population centers, support one side of the Afghan civil war, and just exacerbate that situation and allow it to continue without would, any real reconciliation. Would you get out of Helmand province? I would. I would get out of large parts of Helmand. I would. There's no benefit for us being there. So how far, let's say in the short run, if you weren't, if you were the president not worried about re-election, yeah. which is, there's never been a president like that in, sure, his, first, yeah, in his first yeah. term. So, uh, but. And anyone well, who says that's not a concern for this president is a fool or, well, or, or, or for any lying. President, yeah, for, for any, any yeah, exactly. Uh, if, however, you freed yourself from that notion 
somehow. Um, how fast would you get out, and how many or how many troops in the short run do you think you would you would leave there? Oh, I, I, Six I would, months from now, how many troops would there be already? If you could responsibly withdraw troops, I mean, uh, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of, as you know, tactical and logistical operational issues with something like that, and so you'd have to do it responsibly. But I would like to see us draw down to below below 15,000, below 10,000, um, a, a bare minimum. Uh, to continue to train and support the Afghan army and, and police to a certain degree, but with the main point being of forcing some kind of political reconciliation in that country. Uh, they've been at civil war, they've been at civil war for 35 years. Um, I don't understand why more people don't acknowledge that it's a civil war. There was a civil war. If you go back to the, and look at how the media reported on Afghanistan, up until we, we invaded in 2001, it was constantly referred to as a civil war. Just because us and NATO showed mm -hmm. up didn't make the civil war go away. Uh, it's still there. It's still raging. It's the prime, it's the prime conflict in that country. Uh, I would leave as many troops as necessary to foster some kind of or force some kind of reconciliation between two sides, but I would stop combat operations. Yeah. Uh, in, in those villages, in those valleys, in, the, in those villages where people are fighting us, only because they don't want us there. Um, it, it, you have to understand this notion of what we would call valleyism, which is nationalism scaled down to a valley level. That's what most people are concerned about. They're concerned about what happens in their valley. They don't want people coming in there, particularly people who are going to tax them or take things from them, um, and, and they will fight them if they do. Just as, just as you would find anywhere in this world. Mm -hmm. um, this is what would happen in the United States uh, mm -hmm. if something like that happened. When you've, I've learned from you listening to you the last couple of days, uh, several points. One of them, I think, that is very familiar is, is your point that even the people we're training, especially the Tajiks and, and who are fighting for foreign, are themselves perceived as outsiders mm -hmm. in the places where we're sending them to fight yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and have evoked much the same kind of resistance that we do when yeah. we go. And that another point, that a large part of the resistance to us is the perception that we are backing up an ethnically different mm -hmm. and corrupt and self-serving government uh, that isn't merely a puppet of us, but is an adversary of the people there. Correct. And that we're, that's part of it. That is considerable extent uh, different from Vietnam. Let me let me take a minute, in fact, here, uh, uh, if they allow it, <laughs> to um, uh, to mention that when I when I did hear your uh, your resignation letter first, my one reservation about it was your emphasis that you keep coming back to, which you've now. Uh, enlighten me on that it's being above all a civil war mm -hmm. and my resistance to that was that um, that was a fray an insider's perception of the Vietnam War which I thought was very misleading yeah. people who understood that it wasn't aggression from the north uh, because in fact the north Vietnam was not seen by Vietnamese as a truly independent, separate, foreign country, but as part of Vietnam. Yeah. So the, the notion of aggression was not in their minds. Both sides had in their constitution, Vietnam is one. Yeah. Uh, both sides uh, had that. So uh, they said, okay, it's not really aggression from the North, as we say. It's really a civil war between, they said, you know, the Northerners or the Communists and the uh, Communist-led forces and the others. And I came to feel that was very misleading for this reason, that it was a war that existed only because there was a side, a warring side, that was entirely equipped, paid, basically managed by foreigners and serving the mm -hmm. interests of foreigners. I said, that's not properly called a civil war. Yeah. That's a war against a, a, a neo-colonial power, let's yeah. say, or an imperial power. It's a war against foreigners basically, and their servants, yeah. and their, their collaborators. So to call it a civil war, I thought, was a euphemism or was misleading. Yeah. So when I heard it from you, I was initially resistant on this because I was thinking, after all, they were fighting Soviets. Mm -hmm. Now they're fighting Americans. Yep. How is that a civil war? Well, there is this difference. In Vietnam, the, for many reasons, the communists, after the second world, after 1954 in particular, had the prestige and the respect of everyone as having defeated the French sure. uh, invaders, in the, who had been the colonial power yeah. for 90 years. And they had done that, especially in the North. For that reason, even people who did not want colonial, uh, did not want communist rule, and that was most of the people, 
just because most of the people probably do not want Taliban rule yeah, yeah. or warlord rule. Sure, yeah. But, so it isn't as though they're popular. But in the case of uh, the communists, and that may apply to the Taliban, they had the respect and legitimacy of having defeated a foreign invader. And given that, um, their claim to leadership of the whole of Vietnam was strong enough that even though people might not all have wanted that as their preference, they might have wanted Buddhist or sect or various yeah. other reasons, they were not going to fight it. Yeah. They were, there was not going to be a war unless it was financed by the U.S. The U.S. was in effect for our interests imposing a war that otherwise would not have been a war any more than there's a war now in Vietnam. You know, the sad thing, uh, the sad thing about all this and about any conflict is, is what, eight, probably 90, 90 percent of the people just want to be left alone, just want to raise their families and, and, and try and give their children a better life than what they had. In the case of Afghanistan, uh, and in parts of the south and parts of the east, it's so desperately and god-awfully poor that you're talking subsistence farmers, you're talking people who just are trying to get water out of the ground to, 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 to get through life. Uh, you're talking the average, uh, this is a, a culture uh, or a society where life expectancy is 44 years. Mm -hmm. um, one, in five ch one in five children die before their fifth birthday. Uh, it's a culture so far removed from us in terms, or in a society so far removed from us in terms of our understanding of, of what basic life is like. So, so many of those people just want to be left alone. But that uh, can sound like an appeal, if I finish with this, to our own compassion as Americans say, well, we should help to do something about that, and how can we help that, yeah. this terrible poverty? And I think what I learned from you, but what I, and from everything I hear about Afghanistan, we are not in the end, or even in the short run, going to be helping those impoverished people yeah. by occupying their country and fighting those who will continue to fight and risk their lives and kill and die to expel foreigners and outsiders, including the outsiders we back, yeah. the outsiders of their own yeah. language. Exactly. That, that exactly. We back. Yep. And so that the it's an illusion, a delusion to think that we are helping those people, those victims. Uh, by victimizing them with our airstrikes, our presence, sure, our, which does nothing but evoke more conflict. And it's, and it's, uh, I have friends who were saying this to me a couple of years ago who had served in Afghanistan, both military and, and civilians. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. It's just, mm -hmm. there's, there's a failure in logic here. There's a, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's a failure in, in, just, in just common sense. Okay. Um, well, finally, since we're at the end here, yeah. I want to say you have risen above the failure of most of your colleagues, I have to say, with all the respect I'm sure you have for them, mm -hmm. and I can understand that, but their failure to decide to speak publicly and to break the silence to the public, to outsiders, to the, to the voters, to the Congress, about what they themselves know is the reality of that situation. You uh, have not failed your oath of office to inform the Congress and to invite involve them in this process as the Constitution calls for. And uh, you've spoken up. And really the reason I was so anxious to meet you, came, I came down here uh, to meet you for no other reason to congratulate you, but also to encourage you to realize that uh, you have the power, I think, to inspire other people to do what you've done so far. And that is to tell the truth without concern for your own career and at the cost of career, because that's a kind of courage that is very rare. Uh, you've seen, and I've seen, courage on the battlefield that's virtually universal. Yeah. Everybody you see is being very brave in doing their mission, in helping their comrades, you know, helping the team, doing it. Bravery of an uncommon sort is just routine almost. Yeah. And yet those same people, when they put on civilian clothes and become officials, who've risked their bodies, will not risk their clearance, their access, their career at all. They, they, they don't at all. So I really am so respectful of your willingness to give up the jobs you were offered uh, by the ambassador, by Ambassador Holbrook. Uh, I'm really impressed by that, and I hope very much that that example will be seen and emulated. Well, well thank you. And, and again, coming from you know, a man like yourself, sir, that means uh, quite a bit. I, I certainly didn't take the risks you, you took. I was never had to worry about facing uh, jail time or anything like that or, or being charged with any crimes or... But what um, keeps people quiet is much less than a fear yeah. of prison. It's I, I, nothing other 
than a fear of uh, being expelled from the team. Yeah. But uh, like I, said, I, I appreciate those words. I, I can't tell you how much that means. For me, it was just a, a crisis of conscience that, that got to the point where I said I, couldn't, I can't participate any longer. You know, I was your age. You're 36, mm -hmm. right? I Correct. was your age when I came back from Vietnam, convinced after two years there that it was a losing proposition. I hadn't yet arrived at the realization from reading the Pentagon Papers that we had no right to be there following the French yeah. or supporting the French from the beginning but that it was a hopeless, uh, that we ought to be out of there. But I spent two years, which you've missed, I wasted two years, doing what in effect Holbrook offered, working from inside and yeah. telling the story inside. What the Pentagon Papers, which, which cover a 23 year period, and then it goes on beyond that, revealed was that the president doesn't need somebody to tell him the reality, like you or me, because he has people who do that. Yeah. He has heard it. They have heard it. They're getting the story in there, and for whatever reasons, careerist, ambition, political, yeah. I would say the reasons are uh, very heavily political. Yes. He's ignoring it. So what you have the ability to do is to change the political environment in which he works, yeah. or someday she works, by going outside and working constitutionally to under affect the understanding of the people who don't know the reality because they've been lied to by the administration because they haven't taken the effort. Congress, the public, the media, and so forth, uh, telling them, uh, not speaking truth to power inside and secretly, which is very seductive, but has no real effect. Yeah. Uh, but rather to tell the truth to the people who lack power because they don't know the truth, and you're empowering them by telling it. So that's what you're doing right now, and you, you absolutely made the right choice, and that's what I admire so much. It's very rare. Thank you. I appreciate that very much.